Tantra Illuminated with Dr. Christopher Wallace is a journey through the depths of the human experience as viewed through the lens of the tradition called Non-Dual Shaiva Tantra. This multi-format podcast delves into the fascinating world of classical Tantra and its intersections with philosophy, neuroscience, psychology, and the broader world of spirituality. The aim is to inspire, educate, and ignite transformative conversations. The podcast includes four types of episodes. Conversations with prominent spiritual teachers and philosophers, readings of my own translations from the original Sanskrit texts, guided meditations, and my own extemporaneous reflections on the spiritual life and the awakening process. Today's episode is a conversation, and I'm speaking with the renowned teacher Rupert Spira. Rupert, like myself, has been a spiritual practitioner since the age of 15. He began with Advaita Vedanta, as well as Sufi teachings, but the pivotal turning point in his spiritual life was meeting Francis Lucille, who introduced him to the direct path teachings of Atmananda Krishna Menon, and the teachings of Tantric Shaivism, which Francis had received from his teacher, Jean Klein. Rupert is the author of You Are the Happiness You Seek and many other short books. He lives in Oxford, where I was fortunate to meet with him face to face, although the conversation you'll hear today was recorded remotely. Rupert holds regular meetings in the UK, US, and Italy as well as online webinars and retreats at home. I personally find his long-form guided meditations to be amongst the most powerful and well-crafted guided meditations available anywhere, especially those in his audio download called Transparent Body, Luminous World, which is inspired, in part, by the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. And without further ado, I bring you... Rupert Spira. Rupert, welcome to the podcast. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Christopher, for asking me. I'm very happy to be with you. Mm, Me too. I've enjoyed your work for, I don't know, a couple of years at least, maybe longer. And I really appreciate how you are one of the clearest voices amongst all those teaching in a non-dual mode today. And, uh, you know, there's just so, so little of the usual ambiguity or, (laughs) you know, none of the usual woolly thinking. It's just, it's just wonderfully clear uh, in all of your talks, even just the impromptu uh, ones. So I really appreciate that about your teaching. Good. Thank thank you, Christopher. Likewise, I, I appreciate what I've read of your work, and and in particular, I like the the, the, the mixture of uh, the combination of your very scholarly approach, but you're not just an intellectual scholar; you're you're a, a, a real um, practitioner, for for want of a better word. So this mixture of of um, practice the, and and the felt understanding that comes with it, and your scholar the approach i i appreciate very much oh, thank you and i'd love to begin with um well uh, you had you know such a long history in your life of being exposed to non-dual teachings such as vedanta from a young age um but eventually you became aware of uh, the non-dual teachings of what is often called Kashmir Shaivism, uh, also known as Tantric Shaivism. And you seem to gravitate uh, towards those in a way. Could you share a little bit about that process or what that discovery was like and and how you gravitated toward this uh, somewhat different version of non-duality, which we'll talk about uh, more later? 
Yes, I started in my in my childhood with conventional Christianity. I came across the Sufi tradition in my mid-teens, and and soon after that, the Advaita Vedanta tradition, in which I studied and practiced for for the next couple of decades, and then um, in my mid to late thirties, I became aware of the tantric tradition, particularly, as you say, the tradition of Kashmir Shaivism. And um, initially, I thought that I was kind of making my way through four different traditions, Christianity, Sufism, uh, Vedanta, and Kashmir Shaivism. uh, In retrospect, I see that all these traditions are really, all these approaches that, that are expounded in each of these traditions are really implicit in one another Uh, and that some aspects of the teaching is emphasized more or less in the different traditions but I really see it now as as one great tradition not four different traditions or in the context of our conversation not two different traditions the Vedantic approach and the Tantric approach I feel that um the tantric approach is implicit in the Vedantic approach, although not emphasized. And likewise, I think the Vedantic approach is implicit in the tantric approach, although not emphasized. So it's not really, I didn't really transition from one tradition to another. It was more um, a different emphasis, emphasis within the great tradition that I had been practicing and studying or, all my adult life. Yeah. And was it Francis Lucille who introduced you to Kashmir Shaivism or, or did you discover it before you met him? Yes, it was Francis that introduced me at first to the direct path. I had been on the progressive path in the Advaita Vedanta tradition for 20 or so years before I met Francis. He introduced me both to the the direct path, which is really the, the, the culmination or the height of the Vedantic tradition, and also to the tantric approach, which he had um, learned from his teacher, Jean Klein. So yes, it was through Francis Lucille that I came across the, the tantric tradition. And did he introduce you to specific texts of the tradition, or, or did he? Actually, no, no. Um, he had, I mean, I became aware of um, Abhinavagupta particularly um, at that time. But to be honest, I can't, I, I'm not sure that this is accurate. Don't quote me saying this, but I, I'm not sure that I can remember Francis quoting from a Kashmir Shaivite text once. I, I'm sure he must have done, but I can't remember him doing so. Um if he did do so, he did so very rarely. He referred, if he quoted anyone in this respect, it was his teacher, Jean Klein. He had learnt, he had come across the, the tantric approach, the Kashmir Shaivite approach, approach particularly, uh, almost exclusively through Jean Klein, and not in a theoretical way, but really in a practical way. And Francis really... Um, continued to teach in the same tradition and kind of added his own understanding and also his own character to the teaching that he had received from Jean Klein. So although his teaching was was a hundred percent um it was it was the same teaching, the same understanding as the teaching that he had received from Jean Klein, although he taught it with a slightly different flavor. Um, but it so it was it was really the way that Kashmir Shaivite tradition was passed on to me was was really it came ex- it was th- through Francis and, and Jean Klein. It wasn't through any particular ancient text. Mm. And that that was also true of the of the direct path. In fact, he referred quite often to Atmananda Krishna men on occasionally to Ramana Maharshi, but not very often. But again, there was not a great emphasis on. Um, on on 
texts or or right. traditional teachers. Although there was a great respect for for the tradition, and and when I say the tradition, I mean I mean the tradition, the great tradition, the great spiritual tradition with the capital T, rather than any particular tradition or any particular teacher within that tradition. But there was a great respect for for the tradition, the 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 the, the, the two three thousand year old tradition um which is expressed variously in the in, in the sufi vedantic uh, and, and tantric paths so whilst his teaching was uh completely in line with the great tradition it was a, a, a contemporary expression of it that was really based on his experience and his the teaching that he, that he had received from jean klein more than any particular text and that that i think is a little different from you christopher correct me if i'm wrong you 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 have a a much more scholarly you you, you spent a lot of time i know in uh, oxford and elsewhere um studying and translating um traditional texts so your teaching is is much more informed by your your scholarly research um a, a, as well as obviously by your by your practice your teachers your understanding and so on yes Although in the first instance, and for many years, actually, um, you know, I received the teachings of, of Kashmir Shaivism through my root teacher, my root guru. And so she would quote Abhinava Gupta and Utpaladeva, um, but her oral transmission was extremely important and, and, and yes. powerful for me. You know, if I had just discovered these texts as books, you know, dusty books on the library shelves, I, I don't imagine they could have had this impact. But yes. receiving them through this uh, truly luminous and powerful being, uh, you know, that that it's it's sort of like <laughs> the medium is the message kind of thing where <laughs> she was the medium that 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 affected how I it, experience those texts and they came alive for me because of her transmission and then they stayed alive and I was able to go deeper and deeper into them yes. so I, oral transmission is a huge part of the of the tradition both of tantric shaivism and of the great tradition as as you're speaking of it for yes. sure yes do you know if um Either Francis or Jean Klein ever met Swami Lakshman Ju. If either of them did, Francis never mentioned it. So I, I think probably not. I think he would have probably mentioned it at, at some stage. So I, I think it's unlikely, but don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, I would love to hear about the impact of meeting Francis or rather sitting with him in, in retreat, you know, the, 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 what you received through him that was more than just the words, you know, uh, and how he impacted you, you and your life and your practice. Well, the first thing was that he introduced me to the the direct path for the 20 years prior to meeting him i had been as i said earlier on the classical advaita vedanta path mantra meditation was my was my main practice uh, which as you know involves the the directing or focusing of the attention on an on an object or or, or be it a subtle one and, and and the gradual subsidence of one's attention as the mantra fades as opposed to the direct path where, where we where the attention is not directed outwardly to, towards any object gr gross or subtle we just go straight uh, the attention relaxes back inwards selfwards straight away so that that was that was really a, a revelation for me i i was ripe for it um but had not that made that connection myself so that was really the very first thing he uh, gave me this um the tools it was like uh, it just gave me this pathway where the attention could just go directly back to its source um and then 
later on, well, no, not not later on. At, at the same time, um, he also introduced me to this exploration of of the felt sense of the body and the perceived world, and gave all sorts of um, experiential contemplations um, whose purpose was really to align the felt sense of the body and uh, our perception of the world with the the great recognition namely that that reality is is a single infinite uh, and ultimately undescribable unnameable whole but which we might refer to as, as consciousness or spirit or love it, it it's one thing to understand that it's an, quite another thing to feel the body and to perceive the world in a way that is consistent with that understanding and he uh, gave me over, over a number of years n- numerous um uh, tools to call them exercises it is too um too mechanical too pedantic they weren't exercises they they were loving contemplations of the body and the world um, whose purpose was to, uh, it's not really true to say, dissolve the body, uh, the felt sense of the body and the perception of the world in consciousness, because it was never anything other than that, that to begin with. There was nothing there to be dissolved in consciousness. And yet we, we feel the body as something solid, dense, located, finite, and, and perceive the world likewise. So although... Um, Although we may understand, and, and this may be a genuine understanding, that the re- ultimate reality of the the body and the world is is this one formless, infinite uh, reality or, or consciousness. To to begin to actually feel the body and to perceive the world in a way that is consistent with this understanding w- was something new to me, and that that was a that was really. Um, it it really brought the the understanding into the into my into the felt sense of the body and and into the way I perceive the world. It sort of completed the picture for me in a way, as, as I'm sure you know, Christopher. Uh, Ramana Maharshi said um, that, that the world is an illusion. Only Brahman, only infinite consciousness is real. Infinite consciousness is the world. Well, most classical Advaita teachings only take the first two steps. The world is illusion. Turn your attention away from it. Go back to the source, infinite consciousness, recognize your true nature. But Ramana Maharshi didn't stop there. He 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 took the the, ne- the third step, which is the tantric approach. Brahman is the world. The world is only an appearance of infinite consciousness. But he didn't elaborate that third step. It, and that's why I said, the beginning of our conversation that the tantric approach was implicit in the Vedantic teachings but not often made explicit and it was really this third step that was made explicit in the tantric approach and that was something new for me that Francis introduced me to. Mm. Great I want to circle back to that last point but first uh, I just want to connect these two steps because listeners might not be completely clear about how one leads to the other so for the first one i would call um awareness becoming aware of itself right the 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 central instruction in the direct path kind of teachings is become aware of awareness and That can be phrased different ways, of course, but that's basically what it is. Yes, exactly. Just, just a very mm-hmm. f- fine, maybe too fine a detail, um, it, but I think I, I'm just mention it j- just for, for, for clarity's sake. And, I, and I, I'm fully aware, Christopher, that you know this, but I just want to want, want to say this that when we say awareness becoming aware of itself, awareness is actually always aware of itself. In, in the same way that the sun always illuminates itself. The sun cannot not illuminate itself in the same way that awareness cannot not know itself because its nature is pure knowing. However, uh, our awareness, uh, when I say our awareness, I'm talking about awareness. Uh, awareness is awareness of itself. 
the awareness of being, is in most cases so thoroughly mixed up with the awareness of experience. By experience in this context, I mean objective experience, thoughts, feelings, sensations, perceptions, and so on, that whilst awareness always knows itself, it doesn't know itself clearly. So you're right. Awareness, the, 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 main, the essential step in the direct path is not so much awareness becoming aware of itself, but, but awareness becoming aware of itself as it essentially is, as opposed to its habitual uh, knowledge of itself in a human being, namely mixed with the content of experience. Yeah, exactly. And in the tantric tradition, the way this is often explained is to say that awareness is self-luminous, just exactly, as yeah. the sun. Yeah, it is yeah. always self-luminous. It can only be self-luminous, as you said, but it can uh, be lacking the recognition of itself, which seems strange. But of course, as soon as uh, it, it's it's ready to recognize itself through and in a particular localization of consciousness, namely a human being, uh, it does. As, as soon as it becomes aware of itself, the recognition is there. It's, it's just that there wasn't the ripeness is a metaphor that's also used in the, in the tradition. If, if one wasn't ripe to be a vehicle for awareness's recognition of itself, then it doesn't happen yet. And when one is ready, then it happens at, at, at the smallest touch of, of a prompt, you know, if one yes. is ready enough. Yeah. yeah. So, Sometimes yeah, a little bit more than the smallest touch, but <laughs> yeah, a smallest touch, or, or sometimes, but but yes, absolutely, yes. It depends on the ripeness of the person. Sure, sure. Yes. It's really, really ripe. Then it's just yeah. that that very simple pointing yeah. out. Yes, like uh, become aware of awareness. Exactly. You know? for, for some, that is sufficient. Yes, um, and of course what can happen is that a person needs to go through a process of, again, it's just a metaphor, but uh, they need to go through a process of ripening. And perhaps you did, as I did too, through all these years of um, mantra meditation. Do you feel like that those years kind of created a context in which the recognition was easier or more likely? For, for me, yes, Christopher, but I, I'm a slow developer. I took you know, 20 odd years of, of mantra meditation um, during which I was, as, as you say, kind of ripened. So when I first heard about the direct path, all I required, as you say, was, was um, just hearing, hearing the words um, awareness, becoming aware of itself or the awareness of being. And, and it, it was just, it, it, it took so little, but, as you say, I, I had had 20 years of quite intense study and practice before that. Now, I that doesn't mean to say that everybody needs that period of formal preparation. I think we're, we're all prepared um, through some formal religious or spiritual practice or through life itself. For some people, j j just life itself can be the the preparatory phase in, in their life so that when they hear uh, a, a question such as uh, what is it that knows or is aware of your experience and they pause and as a result of the question the attention turns away from what they are aware of and sinks back into its source for some people life has brought them to that uh, state of maturity when they just need to hear that question once or twice and they go straight back and have a, a glimpse or a taste or of their true nature um but certainly for me you yes you're right i i needed that 20 or so years of preparation but i notice and i'd be interested to to know what your experience is that i notice now with um my meetings and, and retreats that the the average age of my retreat attendee is falling, and in particular, I notice that um, 
many young people are coming now and they are sort of unburdened with not only the religious traditions but the spiritual traditions um uh, 20 years ago yeah. i don't know how many what percentage of people in america didn't identify themselves as religious but did identify themselves as spiritual now an interesting question would be how many people don't identify themselves even as so-called spiritual but nevertheless have a deep interest in the nature of reality or the nature of their self and i noticed that more and more young people are coming that haven't passed through the traditions in the way that you and i did and their minds are um clear and clean and one-pointed and focused and passionate and 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 it, it's it's very i'm always very touched when i meet meet a, a young person who comes with this intensity and clarity not through uh, without having first passed through 20 years of vedanta or sufism or tantra yeah i agree for the most part except that um in my experience the the 20 somethings and 30 somethings i mean they can be extraordinarily ripe as you say without these years of preparatory sadhana but also because of the nature of the culture that they've been steeped in they very true yes they 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 can easily attach to peak experiences i see sorry can, i preempted what you were going to say go go on i'm, yeah, I'm sorry just that that that, that they because of the culture they've been steeped in, they tend to um, attach quite strongly to peak experiences and make a story about them if they have a dramatic mystical experience or something. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, can be uh, a, a, a pitfall on the spiritual path to make too much out of our experiences. You know? Yes, but my experience with working with young people is that, that even if they do fall into that pitfall, they fall into it for two weeks, not 20 years. Good that, point. <laughs> they, they move through it quite quickly. If 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 the pitfall is clearly pointed out to them, uh, there's very little. In most cases, there's very little spiritual pride. Um, but it, they, they just drop it and move on. Yeah, and that is a good point. That that a lot of um, a lot of people who come to this in their 40s for the first time or their 50s it's it, they often have such busy minds they've just been thinking so much for so many years that you can say become aware of awareness and they they it it almost happens but then within seconds they're just utterly captivated by thought and of course this can be the case for a young person too depending on the young person you know um so it's it's i think it's it depends on the person right i think a lot of people yeah. will need yeah. some preparatory sadhana as i did too i mean i'm quite similar to you i would call myself a late bloomer i did mantra meditation and other practices for maybe 15 years before sort of taking the first real step what i would call the first real yeah. step of, of awakening you know yeah i think there's another thing uh Christopher, which is which is um, significant, and that is uh, that even twenty years ago, uh, I, I I met Francis in the late in the middle mid nineties, mid to late nineties. Um, so that was twenty five years or so ago, mm -hmm. twenty eight years ago, and that the direct path teachings were only just then bec um, becoming more prevalent in the West. I, I think something very significant happened in the, in the spiritual, in the worldwide spiritual community in the middle of the 20th century, namely uh, that the three great Vedantic teachers, Ramana Maharshi, Atmananda Krishnamenon and Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, were all teaching r r roughly the same time, middle of the 20th century. And they were all, emphasizing the the direct path they were really the responsible for the for the renaissance of the direct path they didn't create it but they did bring it out it, it used to be the 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 esoteric teaching that you might be given if you were lucky after 20 or 30 years of, of, of preparation they really 
brought it out of hiding, so to speak, and emphasized it. And that, that I think, was, was a, really a revolution in the, in, in spiritual, in the worldwide spiritual tradition. But their teachings, um, they needed some, some, um, tr- uh, some commentary because of the times in which they were speaking, the understanding of the people that translated them was not completely clear to all of us what they were speaking of. It took another generation of of teachers, I think, to to really begin to um, decode the direct path that these three teachers introduced the West to. Uh, Anyway, so suffice to say that towards the end of the 20th century, um, the direct path was then beginning to be mainstream, not, not mainstream in, in general culture, but mainstream in the, in the non-dual tradition. And I sometimes re- refer to it as the, as the, this as the, as the age of the direct path, really towards the end of the 20th century, that the, the direct path really it, it, it grew in prominence. And but 20, 25 years ago, hardly anybody had heard of it. And certainly if they had, it wasn't being explained clearly, simply, directly, and in in a very experiential way. So again, I think that's another reason why why nowadays uh, younger people who are exposed to this very, very clear, clean, experiential representation of of the direct path, why they're, they're, they're getting it quite quickly. So what I find is that uh, translation matters. Of course, I'm a translator, so I'm going to say that. But uh, uh, give a specific example. You know, Ramana Maharshi invited people to contemplate uh, Nanyar, which can be translated, who am I? But when we translate it as who am I, for modern people, it can really trigger a lot of autobiographical thinking about their life story and what they put in their potted bio on on the internet, right? But if you translate the same phrase as, what is me? What do I mean by me or I? Then it can be powerfully effective. And that's really just an issue of of how it's translated. Yes, Uh, yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, go ahead. And, and and of course, th- this question, who am I or what is meant by I or what is meant by me, th- this was the, the question that Ramana Maharshi asked himself. As you, you know the yeah. story, as mm-hmm. a 16-year-old boy, he became overfear, overcome with the fear of death and thought to himself, I, I'm going to lose my parents, my home, my my, my environment, my body, what, what will remain of me? Who, who, who am I when all of these things are taken away from me? So that, that was the question that kind of precipitated itself in his own mind as he went through this process. And therefore, it was the, it was the question that he used to lead other people to the same experience. So he took other people on the, on the same pathway that he himself had taken, albeit spontaneously, during his death experience as a 16-year-old boy. But of course, there, there are other valid questions that uh, um, cause the attention to uh, release its focus on its content and sink back into its source, such as what is it that knows or is aware of your experience, or am I aware, or that... that these are all, I sometimes refer to them as sacred questions, but because they're all variations of, of the same sacred question, namely a question which, a unique question, which invites the attention inwards towards its source rather than outwards towards its object. And it really doesn't matter which question one uses, that we, we, we shouldn't be dogmatically attached to one teacher's formulation of it that that was just the, the formulation that was effective for him and it was relevant at, at his in his time and as you say it wasn't completely mis- it wasn't completely understood by his translators so it probably wasn't translated in the most efficient way anyway so there has to be 
uh, I, I think that uh, there needs to be flexibility, even uh, whilst respecting the tradition. I, I, I think you said earlier the tradition needs to be the great tradition needs to be reformulated by every generation. This was exactly the words that my very first teacher, Francis Rolls, said to me: that the truth needs to be reformulated by every tradition, so that it so that it's alive, so so that you give people fresh bread, not bread that's straight out of the oven. It's still warm; it's not frozen and prepackaged. And so, I think that, in a funny sort of way, to be really loyal to the great tradition, one has to upgrade it. Well, one has to retranslate it, not upgrade it. It can't be upgraded. It has to be, it has to be reformulated. Um, and so sometimes people feel that this reformulation of the, of the great tradition is, is adding something to it, or it's not as pure as it was. It doesn't, you're not using exactly the words that Ramana Maharshi used, but actually in some ways, I think you're being more loyal to the great tradition by reformulating it in contemporary language, because Ramana was only using, or, or Abhinavagupta, or, or numerous other sages, they were using the the contemporary language of their of the time and place in which they were speaking, and to to use exactly the same language, it, it's not effective in our day and age as it was in theirs. So, so really, to be to be loyal to the great tradition, I think one has to also be very free in one's expression of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a hugely important issue. In fact, uh, if you look at, for example, self-realization self -realization fellowship of uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, well, he wrote his famous book, um, you know, 75 years ago, and it uses florid Victorian English that was the mark of an educated person in India at that time. Yes. And it doesn't it doesn't read well now. And, you know, and the, and not updating the language of the teachings uh, means that the average age of people practicing in SRF is very, very high. <laughs> so it's yes. the it's actual proof of exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. You'll be loyal to the letter, but not the spirit. Yeah. And um, just to circle back to the to the experiential uh, uh, piece here of, uh, you know, all of these questions that you mentioned, uh, what is it that's aware of my experience or, or what do I mean by me? Uh, from the Tantric Shaiva point of view, they are questions that trigger what what's called Vimarsha. And Vimarsha means the self-reflective capacity inherent within consciousness, that consciousness has these two primary um, capacities. One is called Prakasha, the capacity to illuminate objects of experience, or, or indeed manifest objects of experience, to be even more accurate. And then this capacity of Vimarsha to, to re reflect on itself. And as soon as it does then this opportunity for self-recognition is there and yes. you you've said a couple times that it's like sort of sinking back into what you fundamentally are and i appreciate that metaphor because it it's as if um without this self-reflection which is not of course mental intellectual self-reflection but the deepest possible experiential self-reflection and and without it we're sort of leaning forward out of ourselves object focused or even object entranced and when we invoke this capacity it's it's like we we fully occupy what we are or at least come closer to that possibility uh and it does feel to me it's almost like somatically it's like sinking into the back body instead of leaning forward out of the body towards uh, the object yes, yes like, like sinking into being uh, rather than reaching for uh, uh, an experience of oneself it, it, it you're just thinking into yourself you're not reaching for yourself but uh, christopher can, can yeah. i can, can I comment on something you said at the, at, at the beginning th th then about this self-reflective capacity of, of consciousness? Uh, I just want to question that, whether, whether it's um, 
what you mean by that or what, or what, what they mean, the tantric, the Kashmir Shaivite tradition, because uh, let me define my use of the word mind. It, it would be consciousness uh, um, plus the content of experience. So um, consciousness, uh, a sort of amalgam of consciousness, thoughts and perceptions would be a um, would be mind. So when when consciousness has has risen in the form of thoughts and perceptions and become or seems to have become entangled with them, it it, it seems to acquire their limitations and as such to become a finite mind. The, the, the essence of the finite mind is still infinite consciousness, but infinite consciousness has assumed the form of thoughts and perceptions and, and, and seems to have become entangled by and limited to them. So it's the finite mind. Uh, so this is, this is a suggestion. This is what I'm questioning with you. It's the finite mind that has the capacity of self-reflection. Once consciousness has lost itself or seems to have lost itself in the content of experience and seems as a result to no longer be infinite consciousness, but to be a finite mind, it is that finite mind that practices self-reflection. Consciousness itself doesn't, it cannot, nor does it need to reflect on itself for the same reason that the sun cannot nor need it turn around in order to illuminate itself. So consciousness is is self knowing, uh, as you, as we both agreed earlier. Consciousness is self knowing by nature, so it doesn't need to practice self inquiry. It doesn't need to turn around. It doesn't need to reflect on itself because it knows itself just by being itself. It's only when it becomes entangled or seems to become entangled with the content. Of, of experience and as such seems to become a finite mind that finite mind which considers itself to be finite has to turn around and reflect on its essence ask itself the question what what am i really so that that this self reflective quality i would suggest is not inherent in consciousness itself the consciousness is does not need to reflect on itself in order to know itself it knows itself simply by being itself in the same way that the sun does not need to turn around and shine on itself, it illuminates itself just by being itself. Yes, and this is actually another example of the issue of translation. When I translated okay. Vimarsha as self-reflection or the reflective capacity, that's a translation many scholars have used before me. But uh, the actual Sanskrit root of the word vimarsha is mersh, which means to touch. And so it seems that the, the, the real teaching here, uh, which has been paraphrased as reflection or reflectivity, is that, um, th is that consciousness cannot only uh, be aware of objects of experience, but can also be aware of itself, this self-luminous uh, uh, capacity. And it doesn't need to make itself into an object to, to have this self-awareness, which would involve a problem of, of infinite regress, which the philosophers of, of Kashmir were, were concerned about, that if consciousness made itself into an object in order to know itself, then it would have to divide itself and then it would have to divide itself again so that that part could know itself. And then again, and so it, it, this isn't what's happening and that wouldn't work. So Vimarsha is really um, the capacity uh, within consciousness that, uh, to become aware of itself without objectifying itself. That's exactly what they mean by Vimarsha. Uh, as they make clear in, in the original Sanskrit. And it's just how do we translate this in a way that gets the meaning across? Yes, yes, I see. Because, of course, yeah, reflection, it, that's, a, that's a, a function of the mind. And one can lead to the other, right? The mind, the finite mind can reflect on itself. 
and in reflecting on itself, in, in inquiring into its deepest nature, it's as if the bottom can drop out uh, of the finite mind itself and 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 you experientially speaking you find yourself in something that's not finite something that has no boundaries and no is 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 uncircumscribed in 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 any way but isn't it interesting that that the finite mind reflecting on itself can sort of then seemingly open this trap door and you fall into uh, this this wider context of of self awareness that doesn't involve any kind of reflection or need to turn around, as you say. Yes, yes. It, it, it we only it's only the the finite mind that needs to turn around in the sense that our mind has to a turn around away from the content of experience, away from our thoughts, feelings, sensations, and perceptions, and travel back, so to speak, in in the opposite direction, but inwards, selfwards, sourcewards, rather than towards the object. And and as you say, when we do that, and when the finite mind traces its way backwards through the layers of experience, it it you you express it nicely. You you say it goes through a, a kind of trap door. Um, it, it's like a blind spot. That it's it's like a a. a there's a place at the back of the mind, which, which is the essence, not a place that, which is the essence of the mind, where, where it can't see itself, it can't see its essence in subject-object relationship. Everything else that the finite mind knows, it knows in subject-object relationship. But when it goes back to its essence, pure consciousness, it, pure consciousness is so close to itself that it that it it cannot objectify itself, even if it. One, it just simply cannot because it's just as the, the sun cannot stand apart from itself in order to illuminate itself. Consciousness sim simply cannot uh, stand apart from itself in order to know itself. So, so for the finite mind, there there is this there is a sort of blind spot at the back of the mind th through which the, the finite mind passes, as it were. And as it does so, it loses the limitations that it's borrowed from the con tent of experience and, and, and stands revealed as infinite consciousness. Yes, exactly. And and blind spot is it's an interesting metaphor because I, I get what you mean, right? Because it's the point within consciousness that cannot be objectified, just like the the eye has a point that, that can't be seen, right? Um yeah. but of course ironically that very blind spot then it becomes like this portal that leads us into uh, a, a much broader and deeper clarity of vision that that encompasses so much more than than what the finite mind uh, yes. does. Yes, uh, exactly. And to begin with, it might seem that 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 blind spot, that little point of pure consciousness at, at, at the back of the mind or at the the heart of the mind, is something in the mind but i i liken it to uh, the full moon in a in a water in a turner watercolor painting at midnight when you look at the painting the, the full moon seems to be an object in the painting in the landscape but when you go up close to it you see that it's the only part of the paper that hasn't been painted in other words the full moon is not really in the painting it's a portal through which you pass out of the painting to its reality, the, the white paper, which doesn't exist in the time and space in which the landscape seems to exist. So th 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 this this um, blind spot or portal or, or trapdoor that you spoke of, is it seems to be the finite mind initially conceives of it as something in the mind, but it, it's actually a, a portal through which the mind passes out of itself. So we, um, when we go through that portal, we, portal we, we pass out of the limitations of the mind. We pass out of time in, into eternity. It's not, it's not in, it's, it's like the full moon. It yeah. seems to be an object in the mind, but actually it's a portal out of the mind. It, it's the portal through which we pass out of ourselves, out of the finite, into the, fi into the infinite. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is in one particular lineage of, tantric shaivism namely the krama lineage this 
what we're talking about here and metaphorically calling blind spot or or or, or trapdoor or portal <laughs> or or full moon in the Turner painting, this is exactly what is called the goddess in the Krama lineage because they specifically say it's a fascinating passage in a particular Krama text where it says what we mean by the goddess is that point within Shiva's awareness or the point within consciousness that cannot be objectified, the point within Shiva that he himself cannot objectify. That's what we mean by the goddess. That's beautiful. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Yes, yes. Um, and, and what's interesting, therefore, is, is that in consciousness's own view of itself, it is what the mind conceptualizes as as nothing or or not a thing because that there's no objective content there so from the mind's point of view it is often represented as a void or empty or or, or nothing of course that's only with reference to the things that the finite mind seems to know but from consciousness's own point of view without reference to those objects it it is not nothing it, it is full to the brim of itself. So it, exactly. It, it's only said to be nothing or void or empty from the point of view of the finite mind, from its own point of view. It, it is plenitude itself. Exactly. Perfectly said. And this actually makes the teaching so relevant. What I share with, with my students is that when you have this fear that deep down you're actually nothing, you're nobody. That is the mind uh, distantly or dimly apprehending its source and misunderstanding it. it, it, it exactly. F f misunderstanding it, formulating it in, in term, with reference to the object's with which it normally identifies itself. So for the mind's point of view, to approach this blind spot, the full moon, the portal, it is, is like approaching death. It, it's like approaching annihilation. A actually, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, 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 what, it's, what, it's, a, it's a rebirth, it's a resurrection. It's, but from the mind's point of view, it can be very scary because it, because it does feel like a death, a, a loss of everything with which it previously defined itself or identified itself. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's interesting because our culture, you know, has the connotation for that nothing is worth nothing. So if you if you implicitly sense that way deep down you're nothing, that must mean you're worthless. And that and that's why everyone's, you know, who hasn't yet had this awakening, I mean, their their deepest fear is that they're actually worthless. And the awakening is precisely the the discovery whether you would put it into words or not that the that the nothingness that you are is actually the source of infinite value because it's a nothing that can become anything and that the, that the mind is just misunderstood and, and and equated nothingness with um or i would call it radiant nothingness yes. with worthlessness which is the opposite of 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 the truth yes Yes, exactly. And, and of course, every time we as a person experience or seem to experience a joy, peace, love, we, we, we are, without realizing it, at, at that moment, we, we cease to be the person we seem to be and, and, and we touch our true nature unawares. But we don't, we don't do so as a person. In the experience of of, of pure joy that the person is actually not present mm -hmm. so so yeah. the, it, the, 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 ironically although that although the apparently separate self fears this dissolution in its source it is in fact the only experience it ever truly seeks namely peace happiness joy love which is the collapse of the sense of being a separate self uh, with its train of, of conflict and sorrow. 
Yeah, so strangely, it, it's it's like the it's like the moth. It's, it's not, sorry to interrupt, Chris. It's it's like the the moth in, in in the flame. That that the moth is the the flame is the one thing the moth wants, but also the thing that it fears above all else. But when when the moth sees the flame from a distance, it thinks, "Ah, oh, that's what I want," and and comes close. But but it but when when it's six inches away from the flame, there is suddenly this recognition: I, I cannot experience the flame. I can desire it, but I cannot experience it because to experience it, I must become it. I must die into it. And so then, then, then it, it, it flies away again. But then as it flies away from the flame, it, it realizes, but, but, but all I want is the flame. So it turns around and approaches it again. So there's this kind of love hate relationship that the moth has with the flame. I love it above all else. I fear it above all else. And it does this dance of back and forth, but until at some stage it has the love and the, and the courage to surrender to the flame, it becomes the flame. And, and then it, it doesn't experience the flame. It, it, it is the flame. That the, the jo- Happiness is the same experience. We, we cannot experience happiness. We can only be happy. Yes, yes. Uh, you must know this wonderful passage from the Conference of the Birds that uh, discusses this exact metaphor in beautiful poetic terms. You, you know that Sufi I, I, poem? I do indeed. That was the the very first text, Sufi text, as a fifteen year old boy that I that I came across. It was that text that that, that put me on the path. Wow, Mantikutia, <laughs> yes. So there's this kind of amazing irony, and and it, it, it you know just goes to show. Uh, the universe has a sense of humor, just to put it colloquially, <laughs> that, that there's this irony that that we're afraid of this of this self transcendence, which will which will remove the selfhood from that to which it's been incorrectly attributed. That is to say, thoughts and memories and and self images uh, and so on. We're afraid of that self transcendence, and yet all the most precious moments of our lives have been moments of self-transcendence. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the reason why, and, and, and it, that's, this is not just us spiritual seekers or lovers of, of truth, but you know, why at this time of year do 60, 75,000 people all around the country go to their football stadium every saturday afternoon to watch to watch their their, their team it's because what, what are they seeking that they, that they, they're seeking that moment just, just that moment where where all their desire and their longing and and and, and it, it is is brought to an end when when the goal it, it is scored just in those first few seconds at that moment the desiring mind collapses the sense of separation collapses that's a moment of self-transcendence and it's ecstatic for many people and it's an ecstatic moment for, for and, and what 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 people are really going for without knowing it is is self-transcendence not not a football match but th- these are the, the, the these are this some of the some of the common ways that that everybody not just spiritual seekers but all eight billion of us are seeking only the flame uh, seeking only to yeah. dive into the flame w- without realizing it. Some of us go through unknowingly through substances, activities, you know, football matches or wh- whatever it is. And and others make the cut path conscious and, and, and go there directly and consciously. But ultimately, it's all a longing for self-transcendence, for the recognition of the the infinite self that we truly are. Yes, it's been said, and I agree, that all longing is really longing for God, if we understand God in this non-dual sense, especially. Absolutely, absolutely, yes, I agree. And there's a there's a Sufi saying, uh, I'll paraphrase it, God does not create a longing without having a reality ready to meet it. Yes, yes. It's it's part of a longer passage that says, um, yep. you know, t- just as we never see uh, rivers make their way towards an ocean which does not exist, and just as we never see birds flying 
towards warmer climes that are not to be found, God does not create a, a longing without having a reality ready to meet it. And of course, there it's phrased dualistically, but we can understand yes. it as a poetic yes. no, evocation. That That's very beautiful. I, I, I like that. I've not heard that. I, I would formulate a similar understanding in a the same understanding in a, in, a, in a slightly different way, namely that um, when the infinite um, contracts or seems to contract into the finite, when infinite consciousness seems to contract into the finite, it and, and in doing so veils itself with its own activity of thinking and, and perceiving, um, it leaves a trace of itself in the finite as our longing for happiness. So uh, it, it, it's, it's the finite mind's longing for happiness that, that, that is really a trace of the infinite in the finite mind and gives that finite mind the, the pathway on which to return. Now, of course, the finite mind thinks, I am returning on that pathway. I am traveling towards happiness or enlightenment or God on that pathway. But of course, in reality, there is no such individual either to travel or not to travel on that pathway. The, the, the finite is just an apparent limitation of the only one that truly is, the, the infinite. So what the individual feels as its desire for happiness or its desire for God, if we can use religious language, is really, it's a, it's a, it's really the, the infinite reeling in the finite. In, in other words, uh, the yeah. way I sometimes express it, uh, our longing for God is really God's love for us. It, 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 it's the infinite that attracts the finite. But although the finite thinks it goes towards the infinite. No, the, 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 yes. the, the infinite does everything. It veils itself with its own activity and then it reveals itself to itself. It's a dance only that the infinite does within itself. Yes, and of course the danger of the dualistic language there is if it's understood dualistically, a person can say, hey, why isn't God reeling me in? You know, he's being so mean to me. I want him to reel me in. Yes. But in fact, it's just, there isn't two. There aren't two here. There's one in, 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 a, in a dynamic process of, uh, of self-exploration and self-discovery of forgetting and remembering and the dance takes place uh, for its own sake, not not for, you know, like, as Alan Watts said, a symphony is not is not all about reaching the final movement, the final bars, you know, that the 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 whole journey we go on is the point. And so, in the same way, the the Kashmir Shaivism tradition. Uh, talks in the same kind of aesthetic metaphor that is to say that this this play or this dance it's like a form of art it has to be understood that way metaphorically because the point of any work of art that unfolds in time is not to reach the end but to experience the fullness of the of the journey yes yes J just one thing to add to this uh, Chris, Frank, and I, I, I know you're very well aware of this, but I think it's important to say this, is that what we're saying, although we're, we're talking about the infinite, the infinite's uh, um, dance w w within itself, the concealing and revealing that takes place in the infinite, this is all said from the relative point of view of the finite mind. So the, the, the dance that we're talking about, the concealing and the revealing, by definition, must take place in time. But in the infinite, there is no time. So from its point of view, strictly speaking, there is no concealing or revealing. But from our human point of view, the concealing of our true nature, the desire for happiness and the return to our true nature are so real that it is legitimate to speak in this way of a concealing, a longing, a process, a recognition, and, and so on. And then we can attribute, and, and, and then in order to, 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 to stay 
uh, within the non-dual understanding, we then attribute all this activity to in infinite consciousness. But strictly speaking, uh, infinite consciousness knows nothing of such things. It, it, all these things are true only from the relative point of view of the finite mind. Because in the infinite, there is no time for any concealing or revealing or longing or returning or recognizing to, to take place. So I, I just add that as um, just to, to, to make sure that although we're trying, we're doing our, the best we can with our limited words to say something that is true about the infinite, we're still only doing so from the point of view of the finite mind. And to a degree, as as must be the case, we are still imposing the limitations of the finite mind on the infinite. And I think we just have to be really careful not to assume that those limitations really do pertain to the infinite. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And from this broader perspective or this, this bird's eye view, you might say, the, the entire play including ultimately the creation and destruction of the universe on all possible scales, that entire play is the self revelation of the absolute. So the, con the concealing that seems to happen within time, the concealing that's then antidoted by the revelation that happens in time, that whole dynamic, that whole play from a broader point of view is all part of the complete, the already complete self-revelation of the absolute yes and from its point of view there's no question of it's ever being concealed from itself just as from the sun's point of view there's no question of there ever being darkness so that that the, the, the concealing and the revealing only seems to be true from the relative point of view of the finite mind yes at, and at the, at the very highest level the infinite knows nothing of concealing and revealing. Uh, the, the infinite just knows itself. It doesn't even know the world w w without localizing itself as a finite mind from whose point of view it can perceive itself as a finite world. But in its own experience of itself, it just knows itself. Yes. And again, we have the danger of this language being interpreted dualistically. We have the danger of someone imagining, you know, a, a, a kind of formless God on high, just knowing itself, it, when in it, fact, we're just talking about different um, phases uh, of, of one thing, like water vapor becomes water and becomes exactly. ice. Yes. So, so, so we could say that... <laughs> The infinite experiences itself as nothing, that is not a thing. But but that that apparent nothingness, that 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 aware emptiness is what we refer to as the universe, as everything. So it, it, in its own experience of itself, it, it it is formless. But that that luminous formlessness is is what we experience as as everything so as you say it's not that, that 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 this formless god is in another realm from the universe that we experience it it is what we call the universe it only it appears that this god's infinite being appears as the universe from our limited and localized points of view so so that 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 that, that no thingness is what we call everything yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is what Bernardo Castro means when he says um, uh, the universe is what the non-dissociated part of mind looks like from the point of view of the dissociated altar. And it can only know itself as a universe or as a world or indeed as an object from a localized point of, point of view in its own experience of itself. It cannot, it, it cannot and does not know itself objectively. There's no objective yeah. experience in its own experience of itself. And, and that's, that's, that, that might sound like a very 
abstract philosophical thing to say, but it's derived entirely from experience. If we look directly at ourself, we, we, we go to this blind spot that there's no knowledge there. There's no experience there. If we go to the very heart of our experience, of ourself. There's no knowledge or experience there. There's just this aware emptiness. Yes, and objectivity melts away. E yes. I mean, that's that's why we metaphorically call it dissolving into the infinite, right, or dissolving into pure awareness, even though pure awareness is only ever perfectly itself. Because experientially, there's 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 this dissolution not only of apparent objectivity, but even of uh, time and space. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So, in the few minutes we have left, I just want to connect the dots back to where we started, or almost where we started, because you talked about two shifts. You know, the first being that awareness be quote unquote, becoming aware of itself or recognizing itself or fully sinking into itself. And then secondly, becoming aware of the body and phenomena in general, of course, in a new way, which if I understand you correctly, I characterize this the second shift um, in, in a number of ways, but one way to characterize it is the profound realization that instead of consciousness being in the body the body is in consciousness and made of nothing but consciousness yes which ironically makes it, it come alive more in direct experience to discover that it's that it's actually within consciousness and made of consciousness is is also to to discover the full aliveness of embodiment uh, uh, which a lot of people might not expect before having that shift. Yes, I I exactly. The, the, the three stages, to, in, and as. Everything appears to consciousness. That's the first recognition. Everything appears in consciousness. That's the second recognition. And everything appears as consciousness or is a modulation of the very consciousness in which it ex appears. And that so in, in the first two steps, everything appears to consciousness and then everything appears in consciousness. There is still this is still a position of duality. I sometimes refer to it as enlightened duality. There's still a subject and object. There's consciousness plus objects. Um, but although we've made a distinction between the, the consciousness and, 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 and objects, it's the discrimination in the in the Vedantic tradition. I'm not my thoughts. I'm that which is aware of my thoughts. I'm not my feelings. I'm that which knows my feelings and so on. But in, then in the third step, this distinction between consciousness and its objects is collapsed. And that's the true non-dual revelation. And it's, it's, it's the third step that I referred to when I quoted Raman Maharshi, the world is an illusion. Only infinite awareness is real. Infinite awareness is the world. That, that's the, that's the, 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 the return uh, again to, to the recognition that what appears to us as the world is in fact the one infinite reality and that is yes. made that is made more explicit it's implicit in the vedantic approach it's made more explicit in the tantric approach and i would suggest i'd be interested to know what you think of this christopher i would suggest that the this um emphasis on the direct path the direct recognition of oneself as infinite awareness is more implicit in in the tantric approach but it's made explicit in vedanta in other words i think the, the vedantic and the tantric approaches i think they're i think they're actually one tradition and that these two approaches emphasize I think the vedantic approach emphasizes the inward facing path the tantric tradition emphasizes the outward or, or but no not let me say it in a different way that that the Dantic path is a path of exclusion. I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm the one infinite awareness. The Tantric path is a path of inclusion or love. Vedanta is exclusion or discrimination. Tantra is inclusion and love. I am this, I am this, I am this. Not just this body mind, but the entire universe. And, and I think these are two that both 
both understandings are contained in, in both traditions. I think the Vedantic approach emphasizes the path of discrimination, the inward facing path, and the Tantric approach emphasizes the path of inclusion, the, the, the outward facing path. But I really think it's one, it's a single understanding. And that's why I'm always a little reluctant whenever I read anything that pits the two approaches against one another. I think that's a misunderstanding of the tradition. I think they're entirely complementary and each approach is contained within the other, although each of each approach emphasizes a different aspect of the understanding. Yes, that's a beautiful way to, uh, you know, bring bring everyone together in harmony. However, <laughs> I, I would point out that uh, the Tantric tradition saw itself as superseding Vedanta for one good reason, which is that they actually include both approaches explicitly within Tantra. It's just that a lot of people don't know this because they're familiar with the the itti itti part as opposed to the neti neti part. Yeah. That is to say yes. that inclusion, inclusion, I am all this, the all-inclusive self. But in Tantra, that's actually the second movement uh, of, of two movements that are explicitly spelled out. So in fact, you are supposed to contemplate the tattvas in the system of the tattvas starting with earth and realize you, you, you're not that, you know, you, you, you disidentify with each tattva all the way to the ultimate, which is just formless awareness. And yes. then, then, you, then you realize, oh, wait a second, everything that I had previously negated is actually that which I am. Uh, appearing in a, as a different form, even though it's not really a different form. So there's yes. the two movements are there explicitly in, in Tantra. Yes, but Christopher, the, the, the fact that you say most people are not aware of that, 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 that doesn't that in, endorse what, what, what I was suggesting, that most people are not aware of it, because it's not, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is true of, the, of your exposition of the Kashmir Shaivite tradition, but most people are not, as you rightly say, are not aware that the, that, the, that the tantric approach does include this inward facing path as a first step. And this is something I, I, I often point out to, to people who, in a rather simplistic way, object to the Vedantic approach, saying that it's um, spiritual bypassing, you're just bypassing the content of your experience. And isn't the tantric approach much better where you include all experience? And, and I, I always say, no, the, the, the tantric a, a, approach also includes this initial turning away from the content of experience in order to recognize one's true nature and then turns back towards the content of experience and incorporates it in this new understanding so uh, uh, i agree with you that it's that it's it's all there in the tantric approach but certainly in contemporary tantra it's not emphasized yeah and this is uh, very unfortunate actually because you know, the, the key here is you cannot realize directly and non-conceptually that the body and everything else is consciousness, is consciousness appearing as that without first realizing consciousness. There has to be the inward turn, what we're calling the inward turn, so that the subsequent realization can happen. Otherwise, you're not really including everything. You're just yes. paying lip service to it, yes. to the and, concept and that, of it. Exactly. And that, that's why on my um, on my retreats, I, I don't make su such a clear distinction between the two approaches as I used to. But, but even with making a less clear distinction between the Vedantic and Tantric approaches, the inward and outward facing paths, the path of exclusion and the path of inclusion, I still always start out one way or another on the inward facing path, which, which indeed is a kind of spiritual bypass. You, you, you are turning away from your thoughts, feelings, sensations and perceptions. What people who levy that criticism at Vedanta don't realize is, is that in the full Vedantic teachings and certainly in the Tantric teachings, we later on turn back towards the content of experience from which we initially and temporarily turned away in order to investigate and recognize our true nature as pure consciousness. 
Exactly. Exactly. The, 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 the thing is that the concern with spiritual bypassing has grown so intense that people are failing to realize the, the temporary bypassing, which is absolutely necessary uh, on the path. You know, it's, it's like if you have an addiction, you know, if you're absolutely addicted to eating ice cream, you're going to have to take a break from eating ice cream before you can have a healthy relationship it, yes. with ice cream. There's no other way. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So we're running uh, close to time here. and may, Maybe another time we can we can talk about this, but I'll just signal um, that in the Trika lineage of, of uh, uh, Tantric Shaivism, there's this teaching on three main stages. And the third is often not mentioned in other uh, traditions. I just want to see what you think, because in, in the, the first stage is uh, this uh, awareness becoming aware of itself, or rather recognition, to give it its proper name, Pratyabhigna. Mm -hmm recognition yeah. uh, as taught in the recognition sutras uh, which you've read and so that's stage one this this uh, 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 going through that portal right and then stage two is the um non-dual the full non-dual awareness the realization that that it what you are appears as all that appears or to put it another way that all the contents of consciousness are made of nothing but consciousness um, in seamless unity without any division without any actual subject and object and that's and that's stage two and that's also characterized as um, what's called the all-inclusive I consciousness Purnaham Vimarsha in Sanskrit the, the the awareness that the I includes everything which again, you can't jump to, you can't jump over stage one. You have to get yeah. there through stage one. But then there's this third stage that's, that they say almost nothing about. It receives very, very little, if any, of the words <laughs> in, the, in the texts, you know. And the third stage is the falling away of I, the falling away of, of even, even a transcendent version of self. And it's described sometimes as it's an, an indescribable, but it's sometimes described as um, not only unity with all that is, but unity with all that isn't. That is to say, going beyond the dichotomy or apparent dichotomy of existence and non-existence, uh, such that non-existence is, is, is not no longer seen in opposition to existence um, and and that entails somehow the the the, the falling away of the I uh, because the I is is the ultimate existent so this is very mysterious kind of third stage and and uh, you can of course break down each of these stages into sub stages if you want but not the third one which is utterly incomprehensible and beyond anything like ordinary experience Yes. Um, go yes. ahead. Just a couple of things to say there. Just a, a small point to begin with. I, I want to um, interpose a, a, a little mini step. Well, it's not a mini step, actually, between your step one and two. Step one, recognition of yourself as awareness. Step, step two, recognition of, of everything that appears uh, uh, as, as an expression uh, made of that awareness. The, the, the first great recognition is I am awareness. I am what I essentially am is is that which is aware. I am nothing that I am aware of. But that recognition by itself is is not, I would suggest, the recognition that is traditionally called enlightenment or awakening or salvation. Because the awareness that I am, although it's not, it, it, I, I recognize myself as that which knows or is aware of the content of experience, but I haven't yet recognized the nature of the awareness that I am. I've recognized that I am awareness, but I haven't yet recognized its nature, its nature of peace, joy, ever-present, changeless, self-aware. So I, I would put in a little step, the recognition, I am awareness. Next step, the recognition of the 
infinite and inherently peaceful, unconditionally fulfilled nature of awareness, that's traditional enlightenment, then the, 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 the um, collapse of the distinction between awareness and its objects, the, the recognition that I am everything. Uh, but I think I'd, I'd formulate it slightly differently. I think this is just semantics now, but it, it, in that experience, I am everything. That, that There is no really I or everything. In, in fact, there is no, and this leads on, I think, to your the third step that you were hinting at, which I was hinting at earlier, which we can say very little about, uh, namely that from the infinite, if, if all there is, is infinite consciousness, then infinite consciousness's view must be the only true view. Now, what is infinite consciousness's view of itself? In, there's nothing in itself other than itself which could be known. So when infinite consciousness looks at itself, as we said earlier, it cannot stand apart from itself and know itself in subject-object relationship. It's too close to itself. So without localizing itself in the form of the finite mind, there's no objective knowledge. Therefore, in, in the infinite consciousness's knowledge of itself, there is no objective experience. And, and, and that, is, that is something we really cannot speak of. Really, at, at that level, the teaching falls silent. There's nothing to be said there because anything we say really is predicated on the on the time and space that seem to be real from the point of view of the finite mind, then we start talking about concealing and revealing and, and, and so on. But in the infinite view of itself, which must be the only real or true view, there is, there is no knowledge. There's no experience. And that is what everything is. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> there's nothing but, to say about it because the it, mind yeah. can't can't go there. It, 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 exactly. That, that that's really, if we're going to speak and write about these matters as as you and I like to do, so we have to step down from that. Uh, otherwise, we would just remain silent. So it's like the Zen master said. If I speak, I tell a lie. That's so true. Everything we say, everything we've said this evening talking none of it's absolutely true if i speak i tell a lie but then he goes on but if i remain silent i am a coward and that gives us permission to speak again yeah yeah absolutely and i think you made a really great point um that that this this first uh, stage has to be understood in 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 two sub stages right where yes. where in the second one there has to be a kind of um, ever deepening realization of the, the nature of awareness, even though we can't actually put it into words. And because these are just approximations, whether we say peace, uh, mm. you know, the peace that passeth all understanding is still just an approximation, yes. um, boundless clarity, uh, 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 unconditional loving presence. These are all approximations. Uh, but they're important to say because somebody who has realized awareness, you know, uh, it, they don't necessarily grok <laughs> fully, fully understand or, or see or experience all of these qualities right away. There's a deepening into it. It's like yeah. it, it's hard to describe because but there's the waking up out of false identity. I'm just a body mind named so and so that was born and will die and so on. The waking up out of that false identity into um, awareness per se is so uh, uh, powerful or startling, and then the person might not suspect without a teacher that there's they need to deepen into it, and and as they deepen into it, these qualities that that we're approximating uh, with these phrases become not only more apparent but but the but the substance of their experience yes 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 exactly wonderful <laughs> so i i hope we uh you know continue this conversation in in one form and another there's 
there's so much. It's like we covered a lot of ground. We and covered there's a lot more. Of ground, yes. <laughs> yeah. There's, 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 both, sorry, go on. Yeah, just just that there's even more to 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 discuss when we get into um, the details of how this plays out. You know, in 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 real life situations. That's a interesting thing because some listeners might hear this discussion as being very esoteric and which is actually a mistake it's it's it only sounds esoteric to the conditioned finite mind it's just uh, when it when you're describing your own experience in this way this is the the simplest way to describe it and it ends up sounding philosophical or esoteric which i which i know you know but a lot of people don't realize <laughs> that this is not intellectual, not philosophical, and not esoteric. Uh, but it seems that way until until you've had the direct experience of what is being pointed to yes. uh, with the yeah. words. And and yet still, there's more to be said about about the practical implications of how how this uh, these awakenings get integrated into our lives, which I hope we at some point. Uh, are able to talk about more yes yes i i, I agree chris it's, it's um it's very nice we both come we, we we obviously share an understanding but we've we've come to our understanding through not radically different channels but 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 through different channels and we have a slightly different language so it, it, it's very nice to speak with you in this way and to and, and to meet in understanding and it's it's beautiful thank you Yes, yes, and that's exactly what you meant by the great tradition. Even though we can point out all sorts of doctrinal differences amongst these traditions that we've mentioned uh, to, uh, in this call, still there's a spiritual path, I would say, you know, one spiritual path of awakening that is being differently addressed by these uh, uh, different traditions. And that's what you were referring to as the the great tradition, I think, and that's where we we can meet once we get clear on what our words mean. Yes, exactly, exactly. And and different traditions, they they not only do they have different different language, but they they have slightly different emphasis. They different uh, they emphasize different aspects of the understanding, but that doesn't mean that they're in conflict with one another. Right, right. Well, to be continued, I hope, when the opportunity it presents itself. Indeed, yes, I hope so. That would be very nice. Yes. And uh, best wishes for your the continued flourishing of your work in this world. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's the most important thing, I would say, because um, what the world needs most is more and more people awake to their true nature because everything else follows from that. Yes, for sure, for sure. And likewise, Christopher, I wish you the very best in your work, your, your writing, your teaching. I look forward to, to getting a copy of your your new book. Wonderful, and, and there's uh, about seven more books in the pipeline, so you'll, <laughs> you'll be able to read more too. Well, why am I not surprised <laughs> to hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, good night. Okay. Uh, good good night. Bless. Take good care. Night. Gotcha. Thank you both very much. Hope you enjoyed the episode. You can always find out more about the teachings of non dual Shaiva Tantra by visiting my website, tantrailluminated.org. And here, if you wish, you can subscribe to a learning portal which has a treasure trove of recordings, including guided meditations, workshop recordings, live satsangs, Q&As, and full stay-at-home retreat recordings, and much, much more. So please do check out tantrailluminated.org. Music for the podcast is composed and recorded by Anne Leader. Find her at anneleader.com.